about six weeks now. Is, is anyone uh, enjoying it so far? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, you know, that, the quality has not been fantastic. We've had a lot of other things going on with the build, uh, with the, sorry, with the painting of the church and different things. But we are trying our best, and we're trying to uh, bring things that are helpful. So we're looking at the the Ephesians, and um, as you said, over the last six weeks or so, uh, the reason I wanted us to look into Ephesians at the, the beginning of the year because is because the letter to the Ephesians focuses on uh, the purpose of the church and the responsibilities of each one of us within the church. And they're really good things, of course, because a lot of people don't really understand what the church is for, what the purpose of the church is for. We live in an island littered by churches, and of course, um, the purpose of those buildings many years ago, um, generations ago, would have been for um, a lot of different things, and Ephesians talks about those different things, and it would have also been a place where people would have uh, been able to think about their responsibilities to one another, to mankind, and to live out that uh, through the Bible teaching and things that they heard in the chapels. But we live in a different age now, and sometimes I think we lose our focus as a church. We lose the uh, DNA of what we're meant to be about. So it's good at the start of the year to focus and refocus on our purpose as a church and on our responsibilities uh, as people within the church. Now, I want to talk this morning about how each one of us has the responsibility of releasing dormant power that lies within each one of us. Let me repeat that to you. I want to talk this morning about how each one of us in here this morning, everyone in here this morning, has a responsibility to release the dormant power that is within each one of us. Do you, do you realise, do you understand, do you know that there is dormant power within each one of us? There is dormant power, there is power um, down in the depths of our spirit, in the depths of our soul, that God wants to ignite, that God wants to use for his purposes. You know, I was watching a documentary recently about an art forger called John Myers. He's a bit of a celebrity, and he now paints portraits of uh, famous people in the style of the great, um, the great kind of masters in the art world. And um, in this documentary I was, I was watching, he was talking to a musician that he was painting. And while they were, they were, they were talking, um, they were talking about their time in prison. They'd both been in prison, and they were talking about batteries. <laughs> and I, I was quite fascinated. Uh, they were having this conversation about batteries. And um, I don't know if many of you knew this, but apparently, if if batteries run out, if you give them a really good bash, yeah, those batteries um, have uh, dormant power released in them, and the cells come alive and they start working again. Is that true? Mm -hmm. uh, have got an electrician? Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. Well, apparently, well, well for these for these ex inmates. They were saying it works. We've got a qualified electrician in there who's saying he's not sure. So the verdict's out. But I like the idea of it. I like the idea of it. I think it's a great concept. And um, uh, uh, the reason I think it's a great concept is because within each one of us, there is also dormant power, as I've already said, that God wants to release. Power that often we're not aware of. We don't really realise how powerful we are as the people of God. There is power God wants to switch on in each one of us and release in us. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the Ephesians, knew of this power in his own life, in his own experience, and in his own ministry. He switched it on, and he'd seen the results of living on life, on and in power of God. He switched it on, and uh, in his ministry, He'd seen it work, he'd seen it come alive, and his heart, his desire, was to pass on this power that had come alive in him to the believers in the church of Ephesus. Yeah? 
Isn't that great when people uh, have got ministry and they've got they've appropriated things in Jesus and they've grown in their relationship with God? And they just want to pass it on. They want to give it on. I tell you, we need to be a people like that. Be passed. And on what we've learned to other people. And in chapter 3, verses 11, 3 to 21, Paul restarts a prayer that he began in the first chapter of Ephesians. He's praying in Ephesians, if you remember from the study earlier on when we were looking at Ephesians, the prayer just stops. He stops in mid-flight in the middle of this prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. And then he picks up this prayer again in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. And that's the passage that we're going to look at uh, this morning. Let's read that passage together. It's a great passage, really encouraging for each one of us in here this morning. Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how high, uh, sorry, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And so ends Paul's prayer. What a fantastic scripture. Does anyone think that's good? I find I want to read things like that, it's just like just loads of encouragement, uh, encouragement after encouragement. It's a great, great passage. And as I said earlier on, it's all about releasing dormant power. And in these five verses that we're going to look at today, we see that Paul focuses on three types of power that are available to each one of us as followers of Jesus. He looks at strength power, love power, and astounding power. So let's look at the first type of the power that Paul looks at this morning. Let's jump into that. You know, Paul's life as a follower of Jesus was characterized by incredible strength. Incredible strength. What a resilient guy. Yeah? We've all read, well, lots of us have read the some of Paul's missionary stories and you know the things that he went through in, in the Bible. What an incredible guy. What an incredibly strong character. This guy um, was a guy who had experienced the release of God's dormant power in his life and continued operating from that power source right throughout his life. Now I'm not saying that Paul's life wasn't going to have difficulties because difficulties, he does, does reflect on some of the difficulties, doesn't he? But it seems to me that even through the difficulties, he found a way, he found um, 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 a, a, a source, he found a, a direction in which to get in the flow of God's spirit, get into the flow of what God wanted to do in his life. Even though from time to time he was out of that, he got back in it, he managed to stay in this consistent walk with God. And I tell you, that is the norm for each one of us in here. And the sad thing is that for lots of us Christians, including myself, we're in and out, we're in and out. And what God wants in each of our lives is for us to have this consistent operation of the power of God running through our lives, through, through our person, so that we impact everyone around us with God's incredible love. Because when the power of God is upon us, the love of God is upon us as well. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. <coughs> so he's operating with this power source throughout his life. We're told in Acts chapter 9, verse 22, that um, Paul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. We have to remember that Paul had only just become a Christian, yeah? And then he's baffling these Jewish people by proving that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. He's proving it to them. And they're so cheesed off with him. Paul has to be, uh, we're told later on, 
um, in in um, Acts, he has to be uh, uh, taken by his followers, lowered uh, 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 through a basket uh, 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 from from the walls of Damascus to escape from the city because he's, he's, these Jewish people wanted to kill him because his, his message and what he was saying was so incredibly powerful. You know, Paul, as we read later on, and we look at his mission and his life, uh, feels the release of the power of God as he sets off on his travels, telling the ancient world about Jesus. Starting in Cyprus, finishing in Rome, planting 14 churches in between. Incredible, incredible strength this guy had. And it was all because the power of God was operating in his life. His life was characterized by strength and power. And he writes to this church in Ephesus to say, you can have this dormant power that's been released in me, released in you also. You can have this strength that you see in me, that you see in my life, that you see in my character, my conduct and my lifestyle, released in you. And do you know what? I'm praying for you that you get some of what I've got. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you something, I wish I'd been in Paul's congregation because I would have been saying, pray for me. I want some of what you've got, Paul. What an incredible guy. He says in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. God's message, you know, to each one of us in here this morning is, I can strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being. I can release dormant strength, power in you. In our work situations and the things that we have to deal with, when we come and we ask God for help, not knowing how we're going to get through a, a, a project or something that we're working on, we can ask God to release dormant power within us so we supernaturally do incredibly uh, well in the work that we have to undertake. In our home lives, sometimes when things are difficult, we've got all kinds of things going off at home, we can pray to God, we can ask Him to release dormant power that's within us to give us wisdom to know what to do in managing our homes, in managing our situations, in dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff. In our marriages, when sometimes there's strain and there's pressure, we can be praying to God for our spouses. We can be asking God for wisdom to know how to, to, to do things and make things better. And sometimes that takes time. Sometimes the realisation of that sometimes takes years in our situations. But we can ask for God to release dormant power and strength to help us in these very practical things of being married and in, in relationships and all this kind of stuff. In our temptations and in our struggles, whether we're tempted by this or we're tempted by that, uh, we, we can ask God to release power in us to give us a spirit of control in our lives so we do not cross the line in certain areas that are going to bring downpour in our lives, disgrace, um, that, that are going to bring fear, that are going to bring um, all kinds of negative things. We can ask God to release all the power in our lives so we overcome temptation, so we overcome struggle. In the new challenges that we have to face when we're facing something, we don't know how we're going to get it done. We can ask God to release dormant power in us so we have wisdom to uh, uh, find people who can help us and we can um, empower them and enable them and give them opportunity to uh, bring the change that's needed to be brought about. I tell you, we can have all this stuff for our lives because God wants us to be living in a place of power where the decisions that we make, where um, the, the, the life we're trying to build for ourselves becomes a life of strength rather than a life of constantly picking ourselves up off the floor. I want to tell you, God wants us to be people who live in strength and it's all about relationship it's all about our relationship with god it's all about how we live out that relationship for god it's all about how we practically put things in place in our lives that are going to make um, our lives stronger our situation stronger the second thing we notice about this passage is that paul prays that the 
church will receive love power. I tell you something, in this generation of lovelessness, we need to be a loving church. And we've spoken into this over weeks and months. We constantly speak into it because we know how important a loving church is. Maybe this church that Paul had planted had not grown as much as it should in the love of God after he left and he'd, um, he'd been released from uh, uh, running the church. Maybe it was going through a love law. You know, sometimes you, you can be feeling the love in church, can't you? Has anyone, has anyone been in a situation where you just walk into the house of God and you just feel the love of the people? We've all been in situations like that, haven't we? And, uh, you know, maybe this church in Ephesus was going through a time where they'd had that and then that had gone for some reason. Maybe Paul had seen this and knew that the, the potential of that church, if it had carried on uh, in, in that um, way of love, if, if they carried on at that same level, if they'd risen in their love uh, and grown more and more in love, maybe Paul saw the potential of that church to absolutely change the whole of the town of Ephesus forever. Maybe he saw the power and influence the church could have had if the root uh, had remained a loving root. And I want to tell you that the root's always there in a church for a church to be a loving church. But we've all got to get grafted into the ring, haven't we? We've all got to get grafted into the vision. We've all got to get thinking in a mindset of love so that everyone operates with a heart of love in the things we do and we say, in the ministry that we do, in the way we go about doing it, in the way we conduct ourselves. Um, it's all about love, friends. He says in verse 17 to 19, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow, that is incredible, isn't it? Does anyone think those words are incredible? I was reading John Stott, and he says that the kind of love Paul is talking about is, is infinity love. You know, God's love is, is an infinity love, and it's a love that goes on forever and ever. Nothing can out, out, outdo or supersede or, 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 or go ahead of the love of God. There's nothing like the love of God. His love never ends, friends. And in each of our lives, We've all had seasons where we find it hard to love, haven't we? We all have hurts in our lives. We all have painful memories in our lives. We all have had those times when we've been betrayed in our love. When Jesus died, friends, he took those hurts, those memories, that pain. In his death, he demonstrated the vastness of his love, the width of his love, its height, its depth, its length. Because he was God's son and he was sinless and he'd never done a thing wrong. And he died for each one of us in here. I tell you, there's no love like that. The Bible says, greater love has no man than he laid down his life for his friends. And Paul says to his church in Ephesus, I'm praying for the fullness of that love to be released in you. I pray that you'll be rooted in it. And as we, we say week by week, our prayer here is that we become a loving church. And the encouraging thing is we are making progress. We're making progress, friends. I can see it everywhere. And in everything we do, we are becoming more powerful as we love our community. You know, just yesterday I spoke to a, a gentleman from the Clan Black Rise. Um, he was at Kevin Ellis's induction service. Kevin Ellis is the new CAB uh, vicar who's coming to the town. He was invited to the induction service there. I shook this guy's hand. I've just been up to up, up, up the front to say hello to Kevin and I've been introduced as the Ealing pastor. And I shook this guy's hand and he said, I said hello to him. And then he starts pouring out all this stuff about how he's heard about the good things our church is doing. He's heard that of how we're impacting our community. He's heard that uh, God's love is in the house. 
And I want to say that when I hear that from people we've got no connection with, that we know nothing about, that people we've never met before, I tell you, we must be doing something right, friends. It's not hype, it's not, we're not just kind of making this up. I really believe that we are impacting this town. And people know where to come. It's just that, you know, they, they do come and they are coming bit by bit. But I tell you, when, when the rubber hits the road, people will know where to come. Because we're, we're doing it, friends, with the food bank and with the mums and tots and with the gap. And, and with the community outreach that we did last year, with the YWAM team we've had, all these different things, we're, we're trying our best to bring things in, uh, to build the church up in love and to demonstrate uh, 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 love to our town. And, 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 and that love has hit the streets. People are taking notice, friends. I want you to be encouraged by that. And I want to say that what God is looking for in each of us is for us to go deep into his love. You know, the Bee Gees, I've quoted them before, there. some reason when I'm writing a sermon, the Bee Gees, did you ever quote Bee Gees when you were preaching? Never. No. <laughs> well, uh, I've done it a couple of times, and I was thinking that song by the Bee Gees where it says, um, um, how deep is your love? How deep is your love? I really need to know. <laughs> you know sometimes I need to know, I'm only joking. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, what I want to say is that um, this, this song is all about needing to know love, isn't it? Yeah? And, and the wonderful thing about this passage that we've read this morning is that um, God tells us what his love looks like, doesn't he? God tells us what his love looks like. We, need, we don't sing to God, how deep is your love, God? How deep is your love? I need, really need to know. God tells us what his love is like already. His love is limitless. His love is high, is wide, is deep. Yeah? yeah. God to God, he's not hiding anything from us. He's saying, my love's infinite. And the more you come, come into my love and the more you experience my love, the more of that love can be imparted into your lives. And it goes on and on and on. And... and there's a great song just been released by a Hillsong Young and Free. It says, uh, We found love that never runs dry from the depths to the sky, eyes fixed on the one who has no end. You stand strong for all time in the joy and the trial. You are the beginning and the end. Your love goes on, your love goes on. Ever your heart will seek Jesus in ev everything. From sky to ocean deep, your love goes on. Through every rise and fall, you are forever at yours. <coughs> One thing we know for sure, your love goes on, your love goes on and on, your love goes on. And I, it's a great song because it's talking about, it's kind of obviously taken from this passage, it's talking about God's love, it goes on, it goes on. There's, there's no limit to God's love. And, and I tell you, that's the kind of church we've got to become. We've got to move in the flow of the love of God. We've got to appropriate the love of God and that, that comes from the way we treat each other, our attitudes towards each other, uh, that, that we, we're looking out for each other as we've said and I really encourage that. You know, I see that you're starting to look out for each other, uh, uh, you know, but it's all really good stuff, isn't it? It's all really good stuff and it's, it's these are things that we can do as a church uh, and I tell you, when I, you know, uh, my, my uh, father-in-law father and mother-in-law in said, but when I first went to meet him in South Court, uh, do, you, do you know the first thing that hit me was, was God's love? It was God's love. It was the presence of God. It was God's love. God's love was in the house. And I tell you, if we are a people who are seeking the love of God and living out the love of God in our lives, if we are people who realize there is dormant love that can be released in us by the power of God's Spirit, and we, we, we walk in a relationship and a closeness with God where we're, we're aligning our lives to the, to, to the way God is, uh, and we feel that love being released in each one of us. I want to tell you that's an intoxicating thing. And imagine an army of people, all of us, each of us, seeking after God with all of our hearts, asking God, Lord, I want to... Uh, I want to press into that power source of your love, your powerful love. I want that love released in my life. Lord, impart that love into my life. I tell you, if we had a heart like that to seek God and we want God's love, I tell you, that love is an intoxicating love. There's nothing like it. It's a love that where people come in and they realize they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be looked down upon, they're going to be accepted for who they are. They're going to be seen as equals. They're going to be seen as, as people who have 
every opportunity to connect with Jesus in the way we connect it with Jesus and say, I don't want to keep God's love to myself. I want to let, let people have God's love. I want to let people have God's forgiveness. I want to let people have uh, an, an opportunity to come to God and say to God, God, I'm sorry for the way I've been living my life. Will you come in and restore me? Will you put your love in my life? Because I've felt your love. I've been touched by your love when I went into that church here in Hollyhead. I was touched by your love. Come into my life. I want to tell you, that, that, that's, that's how it happens, friends. It's our love. It's a, it's a demonstration of, of, of God's love. And people want to... It, they want to connect with God. They want to receive that love. And I tell you, they'll come in here and they'll experience the love of the people of God. And they'll go away to their bedroom at home. Or they'll go away out into the countryside. And I tell you, the love's real. They'll cry out to God. God, what's going on in that church? I want that love in my life. I want you to come and pour your love into me. Your forgiveness into me. The things that they're talking about week after week. I want the real thing. And I tell you, when there's a cry in our hearts like that. I tell you, God comes in, doesn't he? Who cried out to God like that? I cried out to God like that in 97. God came into my life. And I tell you, God's wanting to save people. God's wanting to restore people. God's wanting to pour uh, his love into their lives. Finally, we see that Paul wanted the church of Ephesus to be released into a place where the people were operating and living out their lives in astounding power, friends. <laughs> I believe there is a place where we can get to in our world with Jesus, where we live and walk in astounding power. Paul says in his doxology in verse 20, doxology is like the end of a prayer basically, he's saying in verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Let me read that to you again, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. These weren't just words by Paul. This is a man who was speaking from experience. He had felt the release of the astounding power of God in his life. In Acts chapter 20, we find Paul called to a town called Charles. He's with a Christian community. They're up in a third floor building. And the, the story goes that Paul was speaking on and on. He was telling them stuff from the Bible. They were so keen and hungry for the word. They were, they were listening to it for hours and hours. And there's a young guy called Peter because he's sat in the window. And all of a sudden he falls asleep and falls out this window from three stories and dies. He's physically dead. And we're told that Paul goes down and prays for him. And this guy comes back to life. He's resurrected from the dead. I tell you, Paul, when he's writing this, knew of the astounding power of God at work in his life. He knew that when he prayed for people, they got healed. He knew that when he spoke a word of prophecy, a word of life into people's situation, it was a real word from God. It was going to impact them forever. It was going to sit in their spirit and rest in their spirit and germinate in their spirit until it came to life. Paul had this power of God at work in his life. We have to remember that when Paul was operating, there was no public transport system. There were perhaps a few ships and a few horses you could go on. But he's going right across Asia and he's planting these churches one after another. Christian communities that were established and impacted planet Earth with the gospel of Jesus. This was a guy of incredible, incredible power. This was a guy who moved in miraculous power. This was a guy who had experienced and appropriated astounding power in his life. And in this passage, Paul says, I, I have seen... <clears throat> no, he doesn't say that. I think I said that. <laughs> 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 he says, yeah, he says, um, it's great, isn't it? Where is it there? There we go. <laughs> he was able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Oh, do you know, I tell you, I get so bored in just living out in one day. You know, I, I believe in a God who wants to do immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine in my life and in my situation, in your lives, in Amen. your situation. I believe in a God like that. I believe in a God like that with all my heart because I've, at times I've lived in a flow where God's been so powerfully at work in my life. And I tell you, I've only tasted a little bit of it, and I tell you, I'm hungry for more, and I want it, I want it, I want it, I want immeasurably more done in my life than I could possibly ask or imagine. So how do we get it? How do we get 
a release of this dormant power in our lives? How do we get strength to live out our lives with integrity? And to be able to handle every situation that, 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 that we're in. How do we live a life of love? How do we get to a place where God is operating through our lives in a supernaturally powerful way? Seems to me, and I always come back to this, it sounds so simple. Sometimes I'm preaching and I'm thinking, oh, Dave, they'll not just, just not get it because it's so simple. It's about relationship. It's about walking closely with Jesus. It's about letting this word sit in our hearts and, and penetrate our being. It's about being rooted and established in this word, which is a word of love. It's about looking at this word and looking at our lives and saying, does my life marry up, match up to the standards that God, that God expects of my life? It's about us taking corrective action where that's not the case. It's about us getting before God and, 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 and having quality time telling God our soul, pouring out our soul to God, telling him all the temptations all the struggle, all the, all the things that we're dealing with, telling him about this practical issue and that practical issue, telling him that there's a dream, there's a, there's, 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 there's a vision of what our lives could be and asking God to make that a reality in our lives every single day of our lives. It's about stepping into the things that God is showing us through prayer and, say, and God saying, do this, do this, do this. It's about obedience, friends. It's not difficult stuff. And, and sometimes when you preach, do you know, sometimes, oh, you know, honestly, right, I, I, I'm just not the kind of preacher that's going to say 10 practical steps to get to where you're getting to. I can't, it's just not the way I am. I just believe it's about relationship. And sometimes my life is deficient of a, 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 a vibrant living relationship with God. But I want to tell you that when that relationship is red hot, things happen in my life. Things happen in what I do. Because God's working in it. And that's just how it works for me. I, I, I can't put it any other way. You know, I know there's lots of other people who can preach and give 20 steps to this and it's fantastic and you go and put them in place and it works. But for me, that's how it works. When I'm in love with Jesus and when he's the first and when that relationship's red hot, that's, that's when it works. That's when it all comes together. That's when my whole person... My whole being is, is, is operating in a way where I'm hearing from God, I'm doing what God asked me to do, and I'm having the strength to face some challenges and to overcome some things, and by the grace of God I'm achieving it, and, 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 and things happen. So if we want to see things happen in our lives, it's about us aligning our lives to how God wants us to be. How does God want us to be? God wants us to be holy. Be holy because I am holy. He wants purity in our lives. God wants us to be in relationship with other Christians. And, and building those relationships and being part of the community. God wants us to be people who speak about Jesus. And speak about his love to, to a dying humanity. God wants us to be a, a, a people who... I've gone on. We know what God wants, don't we? And as we teach into this book of Ephesians, all the practical things do come out. Some weeks it's been very practical. Some weeks it's been a bit more spiritual. Some weeks it's been a bit more about relationship and, 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 and the fact that we, we, you know, it's all about being, just having that closeness with God. So it's been about lots of different things, but I hope that's been an encouragement. So let's just pray and pray that God will seal this word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, Lord, you've spoken to us at this morning. We know that your is, is to release dormant power. God, there is power at work, uh, available in our lives to appropriate so that we can live our lives worthy of this call that we have received in you. Lord, my, our prayer this morning is that each of us, Lord, be challenged by this word, that we would, Lord, start to get to a place where we go to the root, the power source, we go to Jesus Christ and we say, Jesus, Bring me close into, into relationship with you. Let me see your love. Let me read of your love. Let me live out your love. Jesus, let me see 
beyond the, poss the, 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 the impossibilities and let me see the possibilities in the Spirit of God. Help me to see the astounding power that you want to release in my life. Lord Jesus, give me strength to live my life in a, in, 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 in a generation that is crooked. In a generation where there's so much injustice. Help me be a strong follower of your words and your call.